The Lord be with you. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, this morning that was wonderful. I know I noticed you pulled your phone out quick. I know you didn't want to hear the gangster rap. You keep on the phone, but, uh, no, no. Or is that Chris's? No, it's uh I hope you'll join me in turning in your copy of Holy Scripture to the second letter of Paul to Timothy. Second Timothy chapter two. Be reading verses 8 through 15 there. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. I still hear pages turning. So. Second Timothy chapter 2, we begin reading there in verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David. That is my gospel for which I suffer hardship even to the point of being chained like a criminal, but the word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is sure, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of this and warn them before God that they are to avoid wrangling over words, which does no one good but only ruins those who are listening. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, may we hear what you would have us to hear. Lord, that we may do what you call us to do, so that we may be the people you call us to be. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Well, when I was in junior college, I I took a class called Art Appreciation. I'd taken the same class in junior high, but apparently junior high doesn't transfer to junior college, uh, even though in Enterprise they're about one and the same. And and I I wish I could remember the teacher's name, and I don't know why I don't. My memory wants to tell me it was Mixon, but I know that's wrong. But I do remember how she looked. She was a very tall woman, had very short very thin but jet black hair. I'm sure it came out of a bottle. She always wore a scarf or an ascot, even when it was humid and hot in the summer. Rumors started to spread that maybe she was hiding some scars from some botched plastic surgery. She was always wearing expensive-looking clothes and had many rings and things on her finger. But she knew what she was doing. She often reminded us that she was a professional artist, that she had painted sculptures of polo players for the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. And so she was big stuff. To be honest, I don't know anybody else who paints sculptures of polo players, but if you know them, they surely know her. I remember in that class, uh, even back then, it seemed so technologically advanced. She would have a projector and a screen in the front of the class, and as we would go through the different eras of art history, she would stand at a little wooden lectern and talk to us about these images. Sometimes they were sculptures, sometimes they were paintings, but I definitely remember when we got to one of my favorite eras in art history, Impressionism, and she had put on the screen one of Claude Monet's earliest works, Woman with a Parasol. And she talked about how this painting was of Claude Monet's early, his first wife and her son, and and how he used color and light to create images, not the traditional shapes and lines trying to make things look real. I remember she would stand at that lectern and point with her long fingernails at the different things in the image, and she'd say, if you could see it in real life, you'd see it looks like the very light of the sun is reflecting off that canvas, and the way that the brush strokes make the grass even look like it was moving. Oh, I was in it, man. I was leaning in. I was eating it up. I was like, yeah. And then all of a sudden, as if tires were screeching on the road or if a bell rang loudly, we were all brought back out of that painting, out of the museum, and crashing back into lower Alabama 
when a voice from the back said, Well, I still think it's ugly. <laughs> he said, I wouldn't even hang it in my bathroom at the house. And that's what happened. Everybody was just, <laughs> but then someone on the other side of the room said, Well, I think it's pretty. I'd put it over my couch in the living room. Doesn't matter, this thing probably costs millions of dollars and ain't nobody ever going to hang it in their bathroom or over the couch. But they just had this sort of conversation. And I could tell, and any of you who are teachers know, once there's a disruption, it begins to sort of boil and bubble up from the class. And there's a conversation over here. And some of them are talking about the painting, but the rest of them are wondering, I wonder if they got ribs over at the scooter store. And I could tell it was starting to irritate our teacher. And so what she would do is she would turn one of her rings around and call everybody's attention back. And I remember what she said. She said, it doesn't matter if you think it's pretty. It doesn't matter if you think it's ugly. This is art. And I remember thinking, boy, I sure don't know nothing about art. I think that, I think that folks think that way about religion sometimes. We put the image up there, and then what we do, we talk about the details. Look at the brush stroke. Look at the colors. Look at the way it's done. Look at the, the doctrine and the theology and the history. And then folks walk around scratching their head. I don't know nothing about this religion stuff. I'm lost. I remember a few years after that, sitting in a class in seminary. The subject was baptism. We were all sitting around the tables. And I remember, it was, it was interesting, the conversation, at least to me, probably boring to most folks, Somebody said, well, I think, I think if we're going to really get down to it, Augustine had it right. Augustine said that baptism, you should be baptized as an infant. Go ahead and wash off that original sin and live the rest of your life knowing you've got that taken care of. And then you can just ask forgiveness along the way. And somebody else says, no, no, Tertullian had it right. Tertullian said, wait until you're about to die. If you knew you were going to die the hour and the minute, just have them roll the bed in and dump you over in the baptismal font and pull you out with a stretcher. That's the way to do it. Then somebody else said, well, you know, where most of us were Baptist, we should really listen to Earl Wicks Vingley, who said this is just symbolic, this isn't real, really efficacious, it's just a powerful symbol. And then way over in the corner, one of my friends, he's a, lot, a good bit older than the rest of us, pastored a little church somewhere down the dirt road in Texas, just kind of raised his hand up and said, well, what does any of this have to do with that nine-year-old I baptized Sunday and his parents didn't come? That'll stop you talking about Augustine. It's as if he said, what does this matter? I imagine those kind of conversations took place in Ephesus. You remember from last week, that's where, 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 where Timothy is in Ephesus. Early Christians all gathered around trying to figure all this stuff out. They didn't even have the Trinity nailed down yet. They didn't even really understand who and all of what Jesus was. So you can imagine these conversations go in all kinds of directions. Folks sitting around the, 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 the booth at breakfast, at Jack's maybe. There maybe there was a Jack's in Ephesus, I don't know. They're sitting around the booth drinking coffee. Well, you know, I think Jesus, I think he was of the same kind of stuff as God, but probably not really God. Oh, no, no, I think, I think he was God incarnate. I think that's what he was. Oh, well, I think he was adopted at his baptism. No, no, I think, I think he had been there from the beginning of time. And on and on the conversations would go. And then there were people outside of the gathering in Ephesus who had other conversations. Well, you know, really, it's not about what Jesus taught. It's about this secret stuff he kept over here on the side for the rest of us. If you know the passwords, if you know the right things to say, that's, that's what it's about. And then there were others who said, well, it's not really even about any of that stuff because you're wrong about it to begin with. It's not about this Jesus person. It's about these, these pantheon of gods and all these other things going on. And on and on it would go until Timothy was just sick of it. And so Paul writes back in the verses we've read this morning. And the first thing he says in verse 8, remember Jesus Christ. Do you notice that? He doesn't say, remember what I told you in the first letter. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, remember, remember the finer points of doctrines I've outlined to you as we traveled around. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, remember the Bible. That's what some of us are wanting to say. Remember the Bible. Remember your scripture. Remember your lessons. He doesn't say that. What does he say? 
Remember Jesus Christ. That, Paul says, is my gospel. Can I tell you something? That makes me a little uneasy. That's too open. That's too, what do you mean, Paul? What do you mean? That's my gospel. What's your gospel? Paul says, Jesus. Don't you, don't you hate that? I do this to my wife all the time. Sally said, what are you preaching on Sunday? Jesus. <laughs> do your kids do that to you? What would you talk about in Sunday school? Jesus. I remember, I remember one time, very early when I was going to church, me and my friend John, we, we were playing what we called Bible baseball. We had children's church. And we'd stand and we'd ask them a question. And if they got it right, they got to go to first base. And so we'd say things like, who, who built the ark? Jesus. Well, we can't say that's wrong. Jesus is, you can go to first. <laughs> who killed Goliath? Jesus. Well, you, no, that's not really. We can't tell you Jesus is the wrong answer. Go to first, right? That's the way we did it. Now, every once in a while, they get it real wrong. You know, who crossed the Red Sea? David, ha, ha, no, strike one. That's how we did it. I feel like that's what Paul is doing. Remember Jesus Christ. That's my gospel. That's it. That's my gospel. He says these other things, which is why I suffer hardship. I imagine it's hard. Can you imagine Paul being arrested, brought in for questioning? All right, now, Paul, what's going on? Jesus. Tell us, what's this stuff that's really, really, what's got you all riled up? Why won't you hush? Jesus. What's this thing you keep talking about everywhere? Jesus. That's it. Throw him in the cell. We can't get nothing out of him. Here he is. That's why I'm in. But the word of God, he says, is not in chains. You can't keep God chained up. And that's why he says this. He quotes this hymn. The saying is true. If we have died with him, we also will live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. And then verse 14, you see what he says? He tells them, this is my gospel, Jesus Christ. And then in verse 14, remind them of this. Remind them of this. Sometimes we need to be reminded of Jesus. I remember one of the first times I ever really went to Sunday school. I was a new Christian. I said, well, I got to go to Sunday school. So went, we sat in a little room, had those old metal folding chairs, sat around, you know, caught up like you do. Then the teacher got out the little quarterly, began to read from it. It was real, real boring stuff, if I'm honest with you. He began to read, and all of a sudden, he just stopped and looked around the room, said, well, I, I tell you, we all in here agree, once saved, always saved. And somebody said, well, now, now uh, hang on. I, I don't know. I don't know if I believe that. And I wanted to say, hang on. I don't know what you're talking about. It bothered me. They argued about it back and forth. And some of you have told this story. I was sitting in the car with my friend's dad. He was a pastor. I asked him, I said, Dr. John, what, what do you think? Do you believe in once saved, always saved? I'll never forget his answer. He said, well, Chris, the way I see it, if you're right with the Lord, what does it matter? That stuck with me. So I don't care about that kind of stuff most of the time. I think that's what Paul said. Remind them of this. Remind them that in the end they can get all caught up in these words, all caught up in these kinds of things, all caught up in arguing and wrangling and trying to, trying to get all the details right, trying to lay out the outline, trying to get it all figured out and all written down, but remind them of Jesus, of Jesus. We don't like to be reminded of Jesus. You know what? I've come to find that. That's, that, that's true. We, we like to be reminded of the other stuff. We like doctrines. We like theology. We like Bible verses and all these other things because we can keep them nice and compact and nice and printed. We can fold them up and put them in our pockets and pull them out whenever we need to. We like those kinds of things. We like them because we can ask somebody, do you believe this? If you don't, you're not my kind of folks. Do you believe this? You do. Then guess what? You're one of me. You're one of us. But Jesus? How many of you? Ask, ask a Jehovah's Witness. Do you believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it starts to get a little complicated, doesn't it? The fur gets thick on the squirrel. Or Mormon? Oh, don't go there, Chris. But no, really. Ask him. I'll do you one better. Ask, ask a Muslim. Do you believe in Jesus? Oh, I, I believe him. I know him. I know who he is. 
When you just are, are following Jesus, when the gospel becomes Jesus, it gets a little muddy. It gets a little hard. It gets hard to hold him. It's like trying to catch smoke. You know what Jesus is? But every time you try to grab him, he goes away. Paul says, remind them of this. Remind them of Jesus. Because wrangling over words does no one good. It just chases them away when you start talking about all that kind of stuff. Some of you have been in my office. That sounds like I'm the principal and you got in trouble, doesn't it? Some of you have been in my office and I've told your parents and that's... But no, if, if you go in my office, I, I have books everywhere most of the time. Some of them are, are nice looking, big bright volumes and bound in purple, some in green and blue. But on a top shelf, uh, I have 14 books, 14 volumes bound in gray. To be honest with you, I've never cracked them open since I got them. It's Karl Barth's Church Dogmatics. In the 20th century, uh, it, it's hard to argue that anyone was more influential than Karl, Karl Barth on Protestant theology. Bart was, was brilliant. He didn't even have a doctorate, but he was a brilliant man. People argued with Bart even after he was dead. Some people agreed with him. But all this, he didn't even finish it. Fourteen volumes and he wasn't done. Somebody asked Bart one time. They said, if you could sum up all of church dogmatics, all 14 volumes, what would you say? And I'm sure whoever asked him that had several pins in their pockets. Because if you read Bart, he doesn't know how to end a sentence. It's all run-on stuff and semicolons and conjunctions. And so I'm sure they had the legal pad ready. They were waiting. All right, how do you sum it up, Bart? And do you know what he said? Do you know what he said? He said, well, Jesus loved me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's what he said. All of that stuff from the most brilliant mind in the 20th century and theology says, oh, how do you sum it all up? What's the end of it? What's my gospel? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Do you know what it reminds me of? Do you know what Paul's words remind me of? There once was a man, maybe more than one, pretty smart, had it all figured out, at least he thought, came, came to this new rabbi in town, walked up to him and said, Teacher, can you tell us what's the most important law? What's the big one? If we had to sum up the whole Bible, if we had to boil it down to just one, what is it? And do you know what that rabbi said? Jesus said to him, Love God with everything you've got and your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Remind them of this, Paul said. Remember Jesus Christ. Remind them of this. For all that other junk is just wrangling over words. And that doesn't do anybody any good. So remind them of Jesus. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Anything else is just wrangling over words. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make us ever mindful, Lord, that the end of the day when all other words fail us and all things get in our way that all that matters is Jesus that Lord when we may get hung up on doctrines on theology on positions on politics or whatever else God whatever else we may place in our way remind us always of Jesus for, Lord, everything else is just wrangling over words, which does no one any good. It chases folks away from you. So help us, God, to turn our hearts, our minds, and all that we are to you 
our Lord, our Savior, our friend, our God, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.